The Buddha was very mistrustful of love as a source for happiness. He noted that there are many noble things that people can do from love, but also horrible things they can do. There was a case where a man had lost his son, and so he goes to the funeral, comes back, sees the Buddha. The Buddha says, where are you coming from? He says, from my, my son's funeral, my only son. And the Buddha said, yes, there's a lot of suffering that comes from the, those who are dear. And the man said, well, no, I don't agree with that. There's a lot of happiness that comes from those who are dear. Here's someone who just suffered a loss of that magnitude. So he goes off and happens to meet up with some gamblers, and he tells them the, the conversation. The gamblers agree with the man that it's only happiness that comes from love. The word of this gets to the king. This is apparently back in the early days before King Vasanity had become a follower of the Buddha. But one of his queens, Malika, had already become a follower. And so I said, this Buddha of yours has said that those who are dear bring suffering. And she said, well, if that's what he says, that must be true. He said, here you are, just believing everything the teacher says, get out of my sight. So she has a Brahmin go and see the Buddha and ask him, what did you mean when you said suffering comes from those who are dear? So the Brahmin goes. And the Buddha tells him a whole series of stories about people who go crazy because they've lost a husband, lost a wife, lost a child. One case where a young couple had just gotten married and the parents of the bride were not too happy with the son-in-law, so they bring the bride back home and they're going to give her to somebody else. So the young bride goes, sneaks out of the house, goes to see her husband, tells him what they're planning to do. And so he can't face the idea of living without her, so he kills her and kills himself, the idea that after they die they'll be together. A lot of suffering and a lot of very unskillful actions. So the Brahmin goes back and tells the queen what the Buddha said. And so instead of repeating exactly what the Buddha said, she goes to the king and she starts talking about some of the king's children, his major queen. Are they dear to you? Yes. If anything happened to them, would you be affected by it? And he said, it would, it would change my life, it would alter my life. And she said, that's what the Buddha meant. We live in the world where there's so much impermanence. We find somebody that we really like, that we love, that we get attached to, and there's a lot of clinging there. The affection is something the Buddha doesn't criticize. It's the clinging, because the clinging is where the suffering is. Clinging basically means that we're feeding off of them. Our happiness totally depends on them, or a large part of our happiness depends on them. And that way they become part of us. So when there's a loss, we feel that like there's a good part of us that's been lost as well. And thinking of all the unskillful things we do out of the concern to maintain a relationship, fear that we're going to lose someone who's dear to us, the, the cases where people will kill and steal and lie and do all kinds of unskillful things in order to maintain a relationship. And then the relationship just gets pulled out of their out of their hands. Either one side dies or else the affection dies. But then you're still left with the karma. Karma lasts a lot longer than affection. It can go from one life to many, many lifetimes down the line. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to find an alternative source of food so we don't have to feed off of our relationships. A sense of well-being inside, a sense of being able to control your own happiness, control your own mind, because that's what the problem is. The mind is out of control. We go grabbing for whatever we think will make us happy, and we end up doing a lot of unskillful things. Because we hold on to something and we find it slipping from our fingers, so we 
get desperate and we try to hold on even tighter, or maybe grasp for something else. Because there's so much dissolution going on. We don't take the time to stop and figure out, well, what should I hold on to? What's skillful to hold on to? We just grab whatever. So we want something in the concentration to give ourselves a more solid basis, so that even though the concentration itself is not permanent, still it's a lot steadier than most of our other clingings, as the Buddha would call them. And it puts us in a better position to regard the relationships that we have. As I mentioned earlier this afternoon, when a young monk ordains, the Buddha says that he should have the same affection for his teacher that he would for his father, and the teacher should have the same affection for him that he would for his son. So there's some affection there, and it's in affection and mutual respect that the student grows. But it's important not to turn it into clinging. Back when I was in Thailand, there, there was a famous monk who I visited one time. He seemed to pay an awful lot of attention to me. I began to get the sense that he wanted me to leave Ajahn Phu and come and stay at his monastery. And I really didn't trust him, even though he was hardly regarded in general. Got back to the monastery, Ajahn Phu yelled at me, the woman in the kitchen yelled at me, and I said, well, at least I'm at home where I feel safe. So we have relationships where there is affection, there is respect. And also there's a sense that when the relationship ends, it doesn't have a lot of ragged ends. In other words, you look back on how you treated the other person, and you realize it wasn't just feeding off the other person. You offered something. You offered a gift of the relationship. That's when relationships end well. The Buddha has a list of four qualities he said, that make a good relationship. They make the relationship good while you're having it. And also when you look back on it after it's over, there's not a lot of regret. You left the other person with something to basically pay for whatever amount of feeding you did off the person. The first quality is generosity giving of things, giving of your time, giving your knowledge, giving of your forgiveness. So you're not totally on the receiving end. And the second quality is kind words. This doesn't mean just speaking sweetly all the time. The other times we have to make a criticism, you try to do it in such a way that is timely and beneficial. In other words, it's something that is actually helpful to the other person. You're criticizing for something that they can change. At the same time, you try to find the right time and place. And Bruce says there are actually times when it is advisable to say something that's not pleasing to the other person, but if you're showing respect for the other person by Say, taking the other person aside, not showing that you don't have contempt for the other person. Then when you look back on your words that you've shared with the other person, there's nothing, there's no reason for recrimination or self-recrimination. The third quality is genuine helpfulness. In other words, when you give a gift, it's not simply for the sake of showing off or making points. You actually try to figure out what would be good for this person, what would be helpful. You help them in their genuine aims. And encourage that person in ways that will be for that person's long-term welfare and happiness. And finally, consistency. The way you were at the beginning of the relationship is if it's solid, you want to make it, make it at least that solid all the way through. If it's not quite yet solid, try to make it solid and then make it solid. And be very careful about how you talk about that person behind his or her back. Be 
the things you say behind the person's back should be at least as good as the things you say to the person in front of the person. When I was with the John Fung, he very rarely praised me for anything. It wasn't until after he died that I found out he'd been praising me to other people, which of course means a lot more. You realize he's not doing that to get gain favor. And when he did die, I remember seeing some of his students crying, and I, I didn't have that sense of loss so much. There was a sense of lacking something, but the sorrow that comes from having said or done something unskillful was not there. I always felt that everything he had done was in my best interest, and I had always tried to respond in kind. So when the inevitable end came, it came with a minimum of regret. So as you think about your relationships, remember one, if you try to place all your happiness, make it dependent on the other person, that's playing too big a weight on the other person. You want to be responsible for your happiness inside. This is why we meditate. And because you're feeding inside, that means the relationship's not so much one of feeding. You want to make it a relationship where you're giving a gift. Because we go through this lifetime. As the Buddha said, we'll never meet anybody, or it's very hard to meet somebody who hasn't already been our mother or father or brother or sister or daughter or son at some time in this long, long time. And so you reflect on it. The, the, main feature of relationships like that is that they end. And so keeping in mind the fact that the relationship will end, what do you want to be able to look back on? Not so much the good times you had together, but the good things you did for the other person. Those feel really good. And as the Buddha said, if you have a really good relationship you want to continue in the next lifetime, so we'll make sure that you both observe the precepts together. Of course, there are times when the relationship is, relationship is okay, you don't particularly want it to last beyond death, so even then you, you observe the precepts. So when the relationship ends, it ends well. So the karma outlasts affection, outlasts relationships. So we're going to train the mind so that the relationships don't get in the way of good karma, and actually can foster it. That way the relationship is good while it lasts, and also good in retrospect when it ends. <laughs>